In this exercise we're going to take a look at shaders in Nuke. Sh shaders allow us to apply materials and textures to 3D geometry and this geometry can either be uh, created from within a Nuke as I have done for this particular exercise or it can be brought in uh, using OBJ or FBX file formats from 3D applications such as, uh, such as Maya. Um, so we were able to apply these materials and achieve photorealistic renders from within our Nuke and obviously we're much more able to control and influence these shaders in real time without having to revisit 3D for, uh, for re-renders etc. As you can see I've got a script open here, if I just kind of zoom out a little bit and look uh, it's uh, I've got three backdrop nodes uh, and I'm actually going to approach this in three parts. Starting with the basics, I want to get onto the Fong shader which is actually a fantastic um, utility shader which allows us to uh, get at lots of different parts of the image from within a single node. Um, but what I want to do as a build up to that is I want to start sort of by breaking that down a little bit and just start with the basics uh, looking at the diffuse, the shader and the emission um, and where they fit into this sort of this pipeline of, uh, of shaders. And we'll build up from that into the Fong shader. Okay, so in this particular node I've got a, uh, it's, it, I've got a, I've got a sphere which is connected to a texture uh, and this sphere is is connected into a scene node, and I've got a I've got a light source in the scene node as well, which is which is which we're going to need in order to see the effects of the shader. I've also got this connected up to a scanline renderer, which enables us to see this in uh, in two D, which is really important when we're applying uh, shaders that we're able to uh, control them from a three uh, from a two D environment rather than a three D environment. And I've got a camera in here, which is framing the whole thing. So let's start from the basics. So when a texture is applied to a, to a, to an object like this, in this case a sphere, um, and a light's added, as I've done here with the direct light, Nuke basically applies an 18% shader onto the diffuse channel and just the diffuse channel. Consequently, the object and the texture will interact with light, um, and if obviously if we move, around, move light around an object, then we will see an interaction between the object and the light. but the illumination will be flat and moreover there'll be no way that we could actually make any adjustments to that without actually changing the light itself and we may not want to do that we may be happy with the light but we may want to change the way that that light falls on a particular object and obviously with this current configuration there's no way that we can do that so this is essentially where shaders sort of fill the gap we want to gain some control over the way that the light affects the diffuse on an individual object then we need to put in an, a, a shader now shaders are accessed from the 3D tools menu, if I just come up here um, and into the shaders, some of those are falling out of the screen capture, I am aware of that but you can see there's the diffuse there, there's the emission there the specular here down at the bottom, there's a few more but they're the three that I really want to focus on today so this is where we would access them but if we come back to my script we can see I've already got them here so we'll start with the diffuse so I'm just going to connect, disconnect the, uh, the sphere from the material and put the diffuse in. So we've lost our texture map, that's the first thing and the obvious thing that we see, this is something more akin to a billiard ball um, and what we're effectively seeing now is this 18% diffuse render of the raw geometry. And if we double click the diffuse so we can get at the panel we can see this, let's just uh, put this back, I've been messing about, so this is where we should be uh, with the 18% on the um, of the of the raw of the raw object uh, rendered. The difference, of course, is that we can increase or reduce this impact now, so we can now actually control that value that previously we couldn't control. I'm actually going to set it back to its default now, and I'm going to connect it back up to the texture. So to do that, we've got a map port coming out of the diffuse, which I just connect back into my texture, and we're back pretty much now where we started. We've got um, we've got a, a flat texture with uh, with 18% illumination on the diffuse channel. But of course, this time, as opposed to as opposed to this workflow, where the uh, where the texture is directly into the sphere, I've got absolutely no control. This time, I can now control this. So I can now, for example, increase the percentage of illumination on the diffuse channel or reduce it. 
so I now have this level of control okay it's really important and this is one of the reason why we've got a scanline render in here it's really important that when we're when we're working with shaders that we're actually observing the the scene within the 2d environment just to show what I mean by that if I just take my uh, if I just take my my, my diffuse up to the uh, up, up to sort of mid value of 0 0.5 and then we come back to our 3d view I'll just lock back onto the camera so we see the same thing I'll just lock that off okay so now if we toddle between the 2d and the 3d view we can see the difference between the 2d the way that new provides us with the, view, the views so in 2d we're getting a much more accurate and realistic representation of what this illumination means so really important that when we're actually adjusting shaders that we work within the 2D environment. But the important premise to bear in mind from this is that we can now, by adjusting this, we can now affect the, the, uh, the effect that the illumination has on this single object without having to touch the light. Um, and this is obviously a single object within this world, but we could have multiple objects, multiple pieces of geometry within this world that we all want to uh, to be illuminated in a slightly different way and therefore we uh, you know obviously there are different materials with different textures that will take different levels of specularity etc and we would want to be able to represent that in some way without having to go back to the 3d application to re-render so this is a great way of actually doing that okay before I move on I just want to point out this we noticed that when we, we connected the diffuse to the uh, to the texture using that map pipe but we've got this other pipe sticking up here now what does this do well this actually, just let me connect it to the checkerboard so we can see, this is going to be pretty grotesque but you will get the gist from it. If we add to this, what this actually does is it allows us to concatenate materials onto this diffuse shader. It allows us to add basically other materials on top of this, um, on top of this. So we, uh, now this, this is pretty uh, pretty hideous and it's and and I'm therefore going to disconnect it but there are lots of uses the premise of that is really important there are lots of uses for that so for example if we wanted to add a material on that let's say some typography or something like that I mean obviously this looks a little bit like a planet scene so couldn't really see a situation where that might be happening but uh, you could easily see a situation where you may want to map a, a piece of typography onto this and get it to wrap around a 3d object this would be something that you could do you could wrap piece of typography over the top of a texture so I hope you understand the premise of that that's a pretty great grotesque example but the premise of that is important so when we were in the tools in the shaders we saw that there were a number of different shaders such as the emission such as the specular and you can see that in the in this particular node tree I've already broken these out uh, or instances of these out so that we can actually see them as nodes and we can see that in the specular for example we've got a, a variety of different properties in the emission fewer but these are these are different properties and effectively what we can do is that we could create a little stack of, um, of shaders connected to the same or to different textures and we could build ourselves up a complex little shading model Okay. The problem with this is that um, is that these little fellas, these these nodes, are actually old nodes. They use old technology. Um, they're only really residing in in Nuke at this stage because of backward compatibility issues. So people that would maybe reopening old scripts that have uh, that that involve these, uh, they would obviously need them to be active so they could make adjustments. But Nuke uh, have, have actually brought in more modern uh, shaders that um, that allow us a much more accurate representation of illumination and shading, um, and are much more efficient in the process. And one of those is the Fong shader, which I want to get onto now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring my um, bring my node graph over to this next bit, and while I'm in here, I'm just going to type two because all these are connected up to the same uh, same viewer. So I just want to, in fact, I'll just uh, I'll just reconnect that to. Uh, that diffuse uh, up there so that I can actually see see that if I go to one now uh, why is that it's because that's no longer connected to the scanline renderer okay so I move into two which is connected to this one and now we'll focus on this backdrop node 
Okay, so the Fong shader, we get it from the same place, into the 3D tools, into the shaders, and here's the Fong. Where is it? There it is, just inside the screen capture. And this is what it looks like. It's got a, f a bunch of pipes coming out of it. Again, same rules as before. Once we put this into the scene, then we will get an interaction, because there is a light in our scene, we will get an interaction on this sphere, and that interaction will be 18% on the diffuse channel. What we've got a little bit differently with the specular is that we've also got some other properties in here. Essentially this, uh, this Fong node is a utility node which contains three shaders in one. So we've got our emission, we've got our diffuser, and we've got our specular all built into the same, into the same shader node, which is fantastic. It saves a lot of time and effort on workflow. Um, and this is a really cool shader. It works well with, uh, with subsurface scattering, provides a really realistic render. So we've got our emission up here, which we we've, we we which will which we'll come back to in a little while, um, and we've got this little specular property. And what I want to do, I've set the emission down to zero, so that's not influencing this for now. We've got this this diffuse at 1.8. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this down, and as I bring this down, what you should see is you should start to see the effect of this 0 0.8 value on this specular that's poking through. So essentially, this is the specular level. So as we bring down the diffuse, we actually start to see that. Obviously, as we bring up the specular, then it becomes hidden. Um, and you can see there that as we bring that down, the specular becomes. And obviously, we can we can lower the specular and make it less intensive. And we can raise it up and make it more intensive. The key word there is intensity rather than size. Um, if you, uh, Even though this is adjusting the size, that's really because of the fall off. Uh, if I come down here, we'll just take a look at this. I'll, uh, I'll try and bring up the... Uh, going to try and get my my values in here okay now I've done that sort of if I center my cursor in this I've come down to a fairly low value 0 0.1 if I come into the center of this specular area you can see the values are at 1.3 ish yeah so they're you know they're over bright in terms of they're actually over uh, over over a value of one but it's the intensity that's the important thing if I if I bring this specularity up we come into the center now you can see the value is now 16 17 you know 17 times the value you know so even though this doesn't particularly look any more white that's really because of the viewing device that we're looking through this is really super bright information and uh, and we can get real hot spots from this so it's intensity is the key rather than the actual size of the specularity we can control the fall off the specularity using the shininess tools so the more we bring those the more we raise those up bring those down we affect the minimum and the maximum shininess, and that gives us control over the um, o over the, the sort of the distribution, the fall off, effectively, of the specularity. You can see there. Okay, so I'm just going to um, just going to control click on those shininess values just to bring them back and the specular, and I'm just going to bring that specular down for now. Okay, so we'll take a look at the emission properly now. We kind of saw it a little bit before, but as I start to pull this up, what you can start to see is it's starting to reveal the dark areas uh, around the around the lower right edge of this sphere. So the emission could probably more commonly be described as an ambient lighting model. Effectively, it's a constant that's applied over the diffuse and the specu specular uh, to fill in the darkest areas. I'm going to set that back for now we'll see that better when we get a texture on this so I'm going to set that back to zero for now and we'll, and we'll concentrate on uh, on connecting our, our texture to this uh, to this shader so you can see we've already alluded to all these pipes that are sticking out of the Fong shader you can see this one map D the D we've got a map E we've got a map S you can kind of work out the pattern now the D the E the S relate to diffuse specular and emission so I'm going to start with the diffuse I've created this little dot node structure here just so that we can uh, just so that we can sort of see as we're putting them on we can see the separate applications. So that is now applied to the diffuse uh, channel. You can still see the specular I'm gonna, let's get that down that, that diffuse that emission down and we'll bring the specular down. We can see that the specular isn't affected by that texture at the moment. That is just purely being affected by the, um, 
that's been affected still by the geometry rather than the texture. The only the only part of this that's been affected is the is the diffuse at the moment. So if I bring this up, oh that's not right. This is not connected to the diffuse. Okay, there we are. That was the glitch. There, this this pipe, which we'll come back to, um, was is not the diffuse pipe. This is the diffuse pipe. So now we can see the effect on the diffuse, just like we saw before with the um, in the, when we were looking just at the diffuse. So I'm going to bring this up to about 0.5, something like that. And we can see that that is lifting up the diffuse, but it isn't having any effect on the specular or the emission at this stage. If I raise up the emission, you can see that that is still taking its texture from the geometry, and the same goes for the specular. So I guess it makes sense now that if I take my specular and connect that up now to the texture, then we will now see the uh, we'll now see the texture affecting the specular level also. And even though it disappeared there, you can see that as I bring that up. You can see that specularity is hitting, is creating a hot spot on the on the sphere, but it's uh, but that hot spot now is taking is taking the texture. And if I if I bring that up, then you can see that I'm making that area much more saturated, much more intensive, and therefore much smaller. Um, and then um, if I bring the if I, and if I bring them down, then I distribute that specular area more widely. As we said, it's the fall off. So we can now hook up the emission to the texture as well and now we can start to bring some of the some of the texture from the darkest areas of the image back and you see how that brings that back really nicely and we get that really nice sense of fall off there in the in the shadowy areas okay what else can we do inside the fong well we've got a color value um, and the color value allows us to change just the diffuse input so if I come into this and bring this up and see that I can uh, can bring this up and maybe create sort of a, a red planet maybe just darken that a little bit that's gone a bit crazy but you can see that that is only affecting the diffuse you see that the the, the specular area is still uh, is, isn't affected by that redness neither is the neither is the emission However, if I just um, if I just sort of scroll this down, we can see that we also have color wheels for the emission and for the and for the specular. So we can actually create a complementary or contrasting colors across the three uh, the three inputs that are affecting the shader. Okay, I'm just gonna. Command Z a few times just to get rid of that uh, color change, and then just I've gone I've gone one too many, so I'll just use this to just to bring that uh, that emission back a little bit. So so far we've only been using we can see that we've only been using the um, a single a single texture, but there's absolutely no reason why that has to be the case. We could effectively be using a separate texture for each of these different things just to prove that take the diffuse out and connect it up to this checkerboard you can see now that the that the checkerboard now is affecting only the diffuse channel so as I bring that down and raise it up we can see that that checkerboard is affecting the diffuse we can see that the emission and this area in the specular region is unaffected but anyway let's uh, let's just take that uh, take that out and reconnect to the texture Okay, just before I wrap up on this, I'm just going to click into space and just bring in another shader. I'm not going to be applying this, but I just want to get it out. It's called the basic material, and if you take a look at this, it looks very, very similar to the Fong. We've got these pipes that look identical. We've got these properties up here. It looks very, very, looks very, very similar to the Fong, which I've got it just below it. Everything looks the same, but do not be fooled by this this basic material it's a bit like the diffuse specular and emission nodes that we just looked at this is old technology um, 
and the old nodes use Garud shaders rather than the more realistic and more accurate Fong shading models that, uh, that, that are out there now. So again, the basic material node exists for one reason only, and that's backward compatibility. There are still quite a lot of old Newt scripts out there that, are, that, that were done before Shang Fong shaders were introduced, and so these need to be there so that, so that compositors can access old legacy scripts and make changes. So do not be fooled by that, and don't use a basic material node when you can use a Fong shader. Okay, I'm just going to move on and quickly spend a few moments just looking at this Apply Material node. The thing about the Fong shader, it's great for adding materials to any piece of geometry, but what if you wanted to add the same material to lots and lots of pieces of geometry within your scene? So this quickly becomes quite a tedious process, and moreover, you're adding in quite an, an inefficient workflow. If you wanted to make a change to that Fong shader, you'd have to make it multiple times. It's not a, not a great way to work, but there is a way around it, which I just wanted to quickly demonstrate. So this part of the scene, I'm just going to hit three just to move over to this, uh, to, to move the viewer over to this uh, scanline renderer, um, and we'll take a look at it. So we're going to be using the Apply Material node to uh, to to to. Uh, which is going to allow us to apply this shader to a whole group of geometry. If I just quickly switch over to 3D, uh, whoa, that's a bit crazy. But nevertheless, what you can see is that we've got a bunch of spheres in here. We've got a card node, which is representing our floor. We've got a light in the scene. Um, and what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to texture all three, all, all these spheres and this card with this Fong shader. That's going to be our goal. So I'll quickly jump back to 2D and we'll make a start. Before we get into this side of the script, I just want to sort of just um, address this issue because this I is is from the previous exercise where I used three dot nodes so that we could connect the uh, the ports up and we could actually see the impact of those ports and we could switch them, etc. Um, but I want to take the training wheels off here and just get rid of those because you wouldn't see this in if you were taking a script from a professional compositor. They would be putting all three pipes in and, and essentially what happens is that they all sort of sit over the top of each other and that's why I did it the way that I did when I was introducing this concept because I wanted you to be able to see the difference. But but in, in this situation, they're all sat over the top. They're all three, all three uh, inputs are still connected up. Uh, but they're all sat over the top of each other. But this is more typically how you'd expect to see a Fong shader connected to a material. Okay, so now I've got that little bit of business out of the way. I'm going to look at how we can use an Apply Material node to influence lots and lots of different pieces of geometry, effect effectively an infinite amount of geometry um, by, uh, by using Apply Material. However, before we can do this, we need to create a collector. In other words, something that is going to get all these pieces of geometry that we want to be affected into a single entity. And for this, we use a merge geo node. So we're, we're familiar with merge nodes from the 2D uh, environment. But what the merge geo is effectively doing is merging together different pieces of geometry. We've got one, two, three, four, five disparate pieces of geometry that we want to be affected. We want to apply this material and this shader too. So this sits in. It's a bit. It's not dissimilar to a scene node in the way that it works. Effectively what it means, we connect this up directly to the, uh, to the scene node and then we can connect an infinite amount of 3D geometry objects to it. Whoops, got the wrong bit. And you can see that it'll just keep spawning out ports as we, as we just connect, connect these up. So there we are. So all of our all of our bits of geometry are now going straight into that merged geo node. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the the, the sort of the, the the concept behind this. In the previous exercise, we applied the shader above the geometry. In other words, we had our sphere down here, and our, our fong shader came in from the top. So this time what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to break our apply material below the geometry. And this is what this is this is what we've put this in for. So by actually bringing the shader in below, we can affect everything above it in the uh, in in the node stack. So what we've effectively done here is we've actually created this container 
which holds these pieces of geometry. So by now bringing in an apply material node below this, we can affect everything above in the stack. So we're kind of kind of reversing the workflow. So I'm bringing in an apply material node, sitting it in here, and all I need to do is just bring it straight in below the regio node in the stack. Now we won't see anything yet because it needs to be connected to a material. That's what this pipe's for. So if we hook this up now into the Fong shader then we can now see the effect of that. Now if you were in 3D mode you may see something grotesque like that. Even if I even if I just hook that up to the camera and lock it off. If you're working in 3D mode, and this is a point that I made earlier on about viewing anything that you're doing that involves shaders in 2D rather than 3D because the differential is so great you can see that you'd be compelled to do something to make some adjustments to your shader if that's what you thought you were seeing but of course it's not this is what you're actually seeing so even even then you may want to make some changes but now the changes that you would make in here are affecting everything so if you wanted just to pop up the specularity you can see how that's affecting everything in there if you wanted to just fall it off a little bit then you can do that and so on and so forth if you wanted to color it a little bit you could come into the uh, into the swatch and color it and it's affecting everything everything that's that's below it in the stack now we can still break something out of this if we decided for example let's have a look at um, this sphere which looks like this one uh, let's say for example that we don't want that to be included we want that to be uh, uh, treated separately well what we might do is get for example I'm just going to do this for 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 the sake of um, for, for, for the sake of giving it a texture so that it can be seen within this environment as it has a, a light you can see that as I've connected that up to a texture it hasn't made any change and that's because any apply material that's applied below that overwrites anything that's above it so I've put that in there and what I'm going to do now is just disconnect that from there and just hook it directly into the scene node and you can see now straight away that that is not affected by the Fong shader at all now that is purely and simply affected by that texture there it's taking 18% 18 of the illumination from this into the diffuse channel just like we, where we started with the stone texture at the very beginning that is now bypassing the, the merged geo, it's bypassing the apply material so it's disconnected it has no relationship with this Fong and therefore you can see that it's treated entirely differently okay so just disconnect that and put it back into the merge geo so it gets picked up by the font okay so there we are that's an introduction to shaders in nuke hope you found it useful